Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the National Fair Housing Alliance's webinar this um, afternoon. This uh, is the fair housing implications of the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you all so much for joining us here this afternoon. We've got a, an exciting and engaging set of panelists to go through a wide variety of topics related to our current pandemic. Before we get started, um, I just wanna go through a brief overview of the Zoom webinar features that we have at the bottom of your screen today for the webinar. It's been a year since we've been out doing Zoom stuff, so I'm uh, sure some of you are familiar with these items here, but let's go through them. So at the bottom of the screen there, there is a chat button. So you um, please don't use the chat room unless there is uh, something that you wanna connect with the panelists about um, specifically. If you have questions for the Q&A section at the end of our time together, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. You'll see a Q&A um, selection there and you can enter your questions there and we'll be selecting some of those questions to address to the panelists when we get to that point later this afternoon. If you uh, want to raise your hand and come off of um, mute and go on video, then you can ask a question and we'll unmute your microphone. You'll have to click unmute on your end also to be heard. So the, with that, um, we will move forward into some uh, introductions, uh, but also before we move forward, I just wanted to recognize that those of us at the National Fair Housing Alliance and those of us in the fair housing movement recognize with great sadness the passing of Walter Mondale earlier this week. He was one of the nation's true champions for fair housing. Mr. Mondale co-sponsored the Fair Housing Act with Senator Ed Brooke in 1968, and specifically its provision known as affirmatively furthering fair housing, which sought to end segregation and expand access to opportunity for all. He was a stalwart supporter of NAFA and an advocate for justice and equal opportunity all of his days. Let's please just take a moment of silence to remember this good and honorable man. Thank you all so much. And we wish um, Vice President Mondale's family all the best. So again, thank you all for being here this afternoon. Um, I'm Alan Lazo. I'm the Executive Director at the Fair Housing Council of Oregon, uh, way out on the left coast in Portland, Oregon. I wanna welcome our panelists this morning. I'm gonna give you a real quick introduction of each of our panelists. And then we're gonna post in the um, chat a link to longer um, bios so that you can read more about these uh, wonderful folks that are joining us here today. So first up today, we're going to have Janine Warden, who is the Acting Assistant Secretary for Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. We'll have uh, Sheena Majid, who is the Principal Deputy Chief in the Housing and Civil Enforcement Section of the Civil Rights Division of the United States Department of Justice. We'll also hear from Brian Green, the Vice President of Policy Advocacy at the National Association of Realtors, where he oversees all the legislative and regulatory advocacy on behalf of the association's 1.4 million members. We'll hear from Nicole Upano, who serves as the Director of Public Policy for the National Apartment Association, where she leads a team of housing policy experts there. And last but not least, we are gonna hear from Lisa Rice, our President and CEO, at NAFA, who leads the organization's efforts to advance fair housing principles and to preserve and broaden fair housing protections, expanding equal housing opportunity for millions of Americans throughout our country. Um, so before we move on too much further, also I do wanna recognize that this is April, so happy Fair Housing Month to everyone. And uh, thank you for joining us for all of NAFA's events um, throughout, throughout our uh, month today. So as we move into our panelists today, I just, I just wanted to, to give a few framing notes, you know, about the COVID-19 pandemic. Like so many of you, I've been staying at home uh, here in my basement and um, been walking around my neighborhood with, uh, again, like so many folks with our pandemic puppy, our new puppy that we had, and 
Um, you know, in so many of our neighborhoods, we've seen Black Lives Matter signs go up. And one of the ones that really has spoken to me has been the one that says, um, listen, learn, and change. And I think what we've recognized over the past year is that we've done plenty of listening and plenty of learning about the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on so many different communities. And we're at a point now where it is time for us to move forward to change these inequities that have been highlighted by today's pandemic. And so we are gonna hear from so many different perspectives, the implications of COVID-19 today, whether that's been the rise of uh, hate and uh, harassment of Asian communities since the very beginning of this pandemic, to those with, living with disabilities who've been impacted by the pandemic, as well as sexual harassment that has been occurring in housing situations, and then moving into the virtual world and the impacts that that has on our different communities. And also we'll hear from Lisa Rice about the impact of the management of evictions and inequalities in mortgage forbearance that are gonna come as part of the economic impacts of COVID-19. I will say that um, as we move into our first speaker to hear from Janine, um, I am the uh, a second generation Filipino American, I'm the proud son of immigrants from the Philippines. And so this particular aspect of what we are experiencing in this pandemic has been difficult for me. And I'm so glad to um, introduce Janine Warden to speak about the increase in hate and harassment against our Asian American communities. So Janine. Thank you very much. And welcome everyone to uh, today's webinar where we're going to talk about the fair housing implications of COVID-19. So this pandemic has laid bare many social inequities, but perhaps the most, one of the most distressing of these has been the rise in discrimination and harassment and hate crimes against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. So there are approximately 19 million Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders living in the United States. And the population is growing. The census estimates that there will be approximately twice as many Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders uh, living in the United States at the end of the next decade. And it's truly awful to see the hate crimes, harassment, and discrimination that's occurring because some have gone out of their way to associate the COVID-19 pandemic with uh, certain Asian countries. And um, because of those associations, which are irrational and discriminatory, uh, there has been an increase in Fair Housing Act violations directed toward Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Um, so I thought you would be interested in hearing a little bit about the types of fair housing complaints that we at HUD have been receiving. In fiscal year 2020, which was um, last fiscal year, HUD received 103 fair housing allegations based on race or national origin or color related to Asians and Pacific Islanders. There has been a significant uptick this year. We're only halfway through fiscal year 2021 and we already have received 89 complaints. And um, that's a very significant increase, uh, probably about an increase of 30% or so. And approximately 10% of the complaints that we receive um, with allegations of discrimination against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders involve some aspect of COVID. And so I wanted to talk to you about that a little bit. 
the types of fair housing complaints that we're currently seeing at HUD are some of the traditional complaints, but they just have a COVID theme to them. So there are some instances where a housing provider has simply refused to rent to someone because they're Asian American and because they wrongfully associate the pandemic with people of that national origin. We've also had complaints of uh, disparate treatment, different treatment of Asian Americans or their family members when they're living in multifamily housing. For example, in one instance, um, uh, a family was told that its child could not go around the multifamily housing development alone or use the elevator alone, even though other children could. So it's a different application of rules. And the only reason for the difference in the application of rules was the national origin, which was Asian American. There are uh, flat out types of uh, discrimination relating to lending. Um, and there are also allegations of discriminatory statements and harassments. I'm not going to talk extensively about harassment because uh, Sheena Majid is going to talk about that. But I can tell you that the discrimination that we're seeing is real. There's been a significant uptick in it. And um, we will fully investigate all of these complaints and where we find reasonable cause, we will seek relief for the discrimination against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. I hope we can bring this hateful association with the pandemic to an end. Um, in fact, our country has had an enormous number of deaths as a result of the pandemic. And the pandemic belongs as much to this country as it does to any other. The second topic I'd like to talk to you about is reasonable accommodations. And in order to talk about reasonable accommodations, we first need to start talking about disability. So a disability is a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. And since this is a webinar about the COVID-19 pandemic, I suspect there's someone out there who wants to know if COVID-19 or the effects of COVID-19 can be a disability? And the answer is yes. As with any determination of disability under the Fair Housing Act, someone has an actual disability if they have a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits at least one major life activity. And major life activities are things like breathing and being able to take care of oneself being able to interact with others. And the COVID-19 pandemic has caused many, many effects on people, some of them physical, where their ability to breathe has been restricted or they've had other types of conditions exacerbated, uh, such as heart conditions. But there've also been a lot of mental health issues associated with COVID-19. And those mental health issues may also rise to the level of disabilities. So when you're talking about potential discrimination in the era of a COVID-19 pandemic, you need to think about different types of disabilities. Some may involve COVID, some may be exacerbated by COVID, and some may simply make people more vulnerable to infection or serious results from the COVID-19 pandemic if someone gets infected. So you have to think about uh, disability discrimination in a variety of ways when it relates to COVID. Um, uh, can someone refuse to rent to a person because they have COVID-19 or have had a record of COVID-19 or are suspected of having COVID-19? No, that would implicate some type of disability discrimination under the Fair Housing Act. The second question that people often ask is, 
what types of reasonable accommodations must be provided in connection with the COVID-19 pandemic. So let me start with what a reasonable accommodation is. A reasonable accommodation is a change, adjustment, modification, or exception to a rule, policy, practice, or service of a housing provider, lender, or other covered entity involved in a real estate related transaction. So there can be many, many different types of reasonable accommodations that an individual with a disability may request. And under the Fair Housing Act, the requirement is for the housing provider or other covered entity to do an individualized assessment. And if there is a disability related need for the accommodation and the accommodation does not pose an undue financial and administrative burden or a fundamental alteration to the nature of the entity's operations, then the reasonable accommodation should be granted. And a failure to grant a reasonable accommodation to a person with a disability under those circumstances poses a high risk of liability because it's a violation of the Fair Housing Act. HUD has seen many, many uh, discrimination complaints alleging denial of reasonable accommodations uh, related to the COVID pandemic. So I thought maybe I would talk through some of these to give you a sense of the kinds of, of um, reasonable accommodations that housing providers may need to make available to individuals with disabilities. So I talked about some individuals with disabilities having a heightened risk of adverse effects if they're infected with COVID-19. Well, individuals like that may need a, an exception or uh, a schedule that allows them to use certain essential common areas, such as a laundry room, or they may need to be able to have um, access to an elevator that isn't shared with other people because they have a heightened risk of infection from COVID-19 or bad results if they do become infected with COVID-19. It's reasonable for them to seek certain accommodations that, for example, would allow them to use a laundry room without a lot of other people around so they wouldn't have to be exposed to potential risks from those people, or to use an elevator by themselves so they wouldn't have to be exposed to risks. So this could be orchestrated uh, with a laundry room by setting out a schedule, uh, someone requests a reasonable accommodation, you can work with the individual to find a mutually agreeable time for them to use the laundry room. In terms of an elevator, uh, signs could be posted that indicate that um, you know, the uh, ability to occupy an elevator is restricted by numbers given the size of the elevator. And so there could be a, a maximum number of people who are allowed to use the elevator at one time. And there could also be a notice that if someone specifically requests to use the elevator on their own, uh, due to uh, a disability that they should be allowed to do that. So uh, there are many other types of uh, accommodations that could be requested. One very common one that HUD sees all the time is the request to have an assistance animal because of a disability related need. Um, in uh, pandemic related times when uh, people may not be able to go out and socialize at mu as much as they would like to, and they may be more isolated, you see an increase in mental health concerns and there may be an increased need. Someone before the pandemic maybe didn't need an assistance animal, but now that they're facing some of the isolation and the inability to go out and interact with others, they may need an assistance animal. That's a very common type of request that we're seeing in connection 
with COVID. Another request we're commonly seeing is people needing to have visitors um, in order to help them uh, get access to um, medications, groceries, family support, not be isolated. So even though a housing provider may seek to put in place a uh, rule that would um, limit the number of visitors that people can have so as to try to manage the possible spread of COVID, um, there is uh, the need to provide a reasonable accommodation. You can't tell people with disabilities for an extended period of time that they aren't allowed to have any visitors. Now, at the same time, to protect the health and safety, housing providers can definitely require people to take the precautions recommended by the CDC uh, asking them to wear masks and maintain social distancing. However, housing providers should also be aware that there may be a need to make a reasonable accommodation to these standard precautions. For example, an individual with disability who lives alone may not have the manual dexterity to put on a mask, or they may have a disability that limits their ability to breathe and they may not be able to wear a mask. So that's a type of reasonable accommodation that housing providers must also consider. Reasonable accommodations to measures that have been adopted in order to limit the spread of COVID. So there are many, many types of reasonable accommodations individuals can ask for. They may ask for new reasonable accommodations because of COVID or additional reasonable accommodations. I'm not going to go through them all right now because I believe uh, we're going to have a question and answer session toward the end of this presentation. But once again, I want to remind people that if there's a disability, and a disability related request for a change or exception to a rule, policy, practice, or service that's a reasonable accommodation. The request can be made orally. And unless it poses an undue financial and administrative burden or a fundamental alteration to the essential nature of the provider's operations, under the Fair Housing Act, it must be granted. Thank you. Thanks so much, Janine. I really appreciate that information. Um, really two critical areas as we are moving through this pandemic. Um, if, if it's okay, there's, there's a piece that um, I wanted to go back to on the uh, harassment of Asian Americans, if, if that's okay with you, or we could save it for the Q&A. Either way works for me, whichever you prefer. Okay, we've got just a minute here. I just want to make sure that we don't lose track of this, because um, I know that we have a lot of industry folks with us here today. So I wanted to ask you, and, and Sheena can also speak to this later, but what should housing managers do if they become aware of or witness harassment of Asian Americans or other protected groups by other tenants of an apartment building or complex? In order to avoid potential liability, housing providers or managers at um, at multifamily housing complexes, when they witness that type of harassment, they should really take appropriate steps to uh, correct and end the harassment. They should really advise the other tenants that harassment of that kind is not appropriate and take whatever steps are within their control, such as warnings under leases, et cetera, in order to stop the harassment. That's the obligation. Great, thank you. I just wanted to make sure that folks understood what their obligations were and, um, and we'll talk more about what uh, folks' rights are uh, in their living situations. So thank you so much, Janine. We'll uh, circle back uh, during the question and answer period. I see some um, questions flowing in. And again, a reminder for folks, if you have questions that you'd like for us to pose to the panelists, you can use the um, Q&A tab at the bottom there and we'll start organizing those uh, for our time together a little bit later. So next, I wanted to turn to uh, Sheena Majid to talk about um, sexual harassment and housing situations. Again, all forms of hate and harassment are difficult to deal with and heinous. But particularly during these times of the COVID-19 pandemic, we've seen a rise 
in sexual harassment in living situations. And wanted to have um, Sheena talk a little bit about um, that aspect of what we are experiencing over the past year. So Sheena, go ahead and take it from here. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Um, and very appreciative of the opportunity to be a part of this panel and to have this discussion with all of you. Um, just bear with me a moment. I'm gonna hopefully share my screen with all of you. Okay, hopefully you can see that. Um, all right, um, can you see that? Okay, great. Okay, um, so uh, I think as Alan said, um, I head up the housing section in the Civil Rights Division at uh, DOJ, the Department of Justice. Our office enforces the Federal Fair Housing Act among a number of other civil rights statutes uh, prohibiting discrimination in, in housing and lending and public accommodations. One of the big priority areas for us uh, this year uh, or in the past uh, really several years has been um, uh, in combating sexual harassment in housing. And uh, uh, I would say that, you know, I think most of you know this, but you know, sexual harassment is, is a form of sex discrimination um, and uh, it's prohibited by, by the act. Um, uh, the act also uh, prohibits threats and retaliation, including retaliatory evictions. And that's another tool that we, we do use in these cases. So um, I wanted to, to sort of start by uh, sharing um, a public service announcement that we put together couple of years ago uh, to try to increase um, people's awareness and reporting of this issue to HUD and to DOJ. He knew that I needed a place to live. So that's when he started making his move on me. He was like, well, if you don't sleep with me, then the sheriff's to be putting you out on Monday. Before I knew it, I heard his belt buckle rattling. I look up and he was exposed. I felt like no one would listen to me. He had more power than I did. I was just a tenant. He was a property manager. I would always be on alert. Like when he go use his key or Come, have you already been in my house or while I was asleep or something? It was like, you either do this or you're on the streets. I felt like I didn't have a choice, and so I did what I had to do. Yeah, I was afraid. People shouldn't be treated like this because they need a place to live. Okay, um, so the counts and stories of uh, Autumn and Tamika and Stephanie that you heard there, all of whom were three persons in our cases, um, really are unfortunately uh, far too common. Um, the conduct uh, they describe is conduct that we see again and again in our uh, large scale pattern of practice cases, uh, landlords or others with control really over housing, um, preying on tenants uh, who may be economically vulnerable um, and uh, the conduct can be anything from unwelcome or unwanted sexually uh, to text messages, uh, really to assault and rape. Um, and uh, other conduct that you heard there, common in these complaints, demanding sex in exchange for housing, threatening eviction, unless tenants agree to sexual acts, entering tenants' units uh, without permission at night, installing cameras in tenants' units, and really retaliating for refusing to gauge in uh, sexual uh, acts. Um, I would say, and here's just a slide. I know I saw in the chat, the slides are blurry. I think they're, they will be made um, available for those of you who might not be able to see it. Um, those are some of the common allegations we see in uh, our complaints. Um, aggrieved persons, these are you know, the victims and some of whom you saw in that video, really tenants or applicants for housing um, often they are the uh, most vulnerable people among us, single moms uh, with children, 
often escaping homelessness or domestic violence situation, uh, economically precarious, maybe low income or in low wage work, uh, dealing with addiction, trauma, um, and sometimes uh, just with very, very few housing options. Um, what we hear again and again uh, from many aggrieved persons, um, they are you know, head of households that really feel as though they have no choice but to acquiesce to the harassment. Um, otherwise, uh, you know, they fear being put out on the streets or uh, not having a roof over there in their children's head. So COVID um, exacerbates all of this, all of the pressures, all of the, the economic uh, vulnerabilities. Um, and you know, Lisa and maybe even Janine, because they, they uh, you know, keep uh, the data and the reporting on these trends, maybe you'll just speak to the specific numbers because DOJ does a larger scale pattern or practice cases, we don't keep the data on individual uh, sexual harassment reports. But I will say just from observations and trends, I think we have a, a, a concern that people are far more vulnerable to sexual harassment uh, based on what we're seeing in our large scale cases uh, because of COVID. Often, um, you know, as I mentioned, aggrieved persons uh, are lower income or have limited housing options. And uh, very few um, have uh, choices for employment. Uh, and with record high unemployment, uh, as it is during COVID, this just uh, makes things worse. Um, the eviction moratorium um, uh, did offer, I would say, in some, in some respects, uh, a reprieve. But we are very concerned that the floodgates will open when that moratorium is lifted um, and that uh, individuals will be much more susceptible uh, and uh, vulnerable to harassment, especially true of demands for sexual acts uh, in lieu of staving off evictions. Um, and of course, um, you know, there's a concern that unscrupulous landlords may take advantage of these circumstances to uh, sexually harass tenants who have no choice. I will say in addition to the economic pressures that the pandemic has imposed, um, making it very hard for uh, harassment victims. The isolation of the pandemic has been kind of a double whammy and makes people more vulnerable. And the reason for that is that tenants have a, a, have a much more difficult time avoiding a harasser when they have to stay home. Um, you know, prior friends and family members would sometimes move the harassment would come over and ensure that the tenant was not left alone, but that just isn't possible in many situations, people aren't coming over, people aren't staying over and um, tenants don't have a place to go. So that too is making it more difficult. And I would say that reporting has been impacted and you know, Lisa might be able to speak to, to again reporting, but there is a significant concern that we have that you know, harassment was already underreported for a variety of reasons, um, sense of trust or fear of retaliation. Um, but also if people don't feel like they have a place to go, um, they may uh, just not feel as though they can report right now. So I would say all of this um, makes it even more important as uh, advocates and leaders in the industry and all of us uh, who work uh, in organizations uh, uh, and work with potential uh, uh, victims and aggrieved persons that we uh, keep up the outreach uh, certainly on this issue um, and advise and help people uh, know where to go if they're experiencing harassment. And um, just want to mention briefly some of the, the places that people can go and the steps that uh, you all as advocates uh, or industry, persons in the industry um, can help take. Um, HUD obviously or equivalent state agencies can receive a complaint within one year. Um, uh, People can go to their housing organizations and report, and those organizations can help them with those complaints. Um, we, uh, obviously, if the conduct is criminal, to contact the authorities. Often, if the conduct does involve some criminal conduct. So in our cases, at least, uh, law enforcement has been involved. Um, if uh, you know, there are multiple cases, multiple victims, um, that's something that DOJ can look into. We have pattern of practice authority, meaning multiple incidents. Uh, and uh, the other thing is that while you know, HUD, uh, you need to report within one year, 
um, if we have, um, we can bring a suit as long as there's a violation within three years of the last act. So even if, for example, someone isn't able to report because of COVID, um, if there are more recent incidents, we may be able to help uh, that person who wasn't able to report in time. So um, our website, I know that we are kind of trying to stick to a, a schedule, but our website has a lot of uh, resources available um, to persons who want more information about how to report and what to do. Um, it has uh, resources in 13 different languages, a toolkit, flyers, information sheets. So I encourage folks to, to check that out uh, if they can. And I just wanna mention just what DOJ's role has been in this space. Um, again, we, we don't um, do the individual cases, but we have um, filed many uh, pattern of practice cases, 21 in the last few years, um, and have resolved eight of them. They're not the same. They're not a subset of the 21. Um, there are include cases that were filed previously. But all told, um, in the last few years, we've been able to recover a little over 3 million per victim um, in damages. But we can also do um, some other things that are really important uh, on the injunctive relief side. And in particular, we can ensure that harassers, landlords, or property managers um, do not contact the victims or any witnesses. In some cases, they are um, barred from managing the properties altogether and they have to bring in an independent manager depending on, on the conduct. So there are a lot of remedies that we have at our disposal. And this slide just includes some of our contact information um, and uh, uh, website information for additional resources. Great, thank you so much, Sheena. Um, you know, as, a, as an organization, a fair housing organization uh, in the fair housing movement, we certainly share your concern and the department's concern about sexual harassment in this environment that we have, uh, you know, in, in the COVID-19 environment as well as we know is entering into the next phase of this where there are gonna be so many economic impacts in communities. Um, if I could, I wanted to just make sure I asked a, a quick follow-up on, on what you were talking about, especially the contact information at the end there. What happens if an individual survivor of sexual harassment contacts the Department of Justice? I know that you are involved, like you said, in, in a lot of pattern and practice pieces, but what if individuals contact the um, DOJ? Yeah. Um, that's a great question, and they will always get a call back. We have somebody um, who's designated to screen all of those uh, calls and people back will follow up. And many, many of um, our pattern of practice cases have actually come oh. individual calls, and then we do follow up. We you know canvas other tenants um, in those buildings. So very rarely is it always just one person, um, and so that's the lesson. If, if you don't know where else to, to go. There are no wrong doors. Um, and please feel free to call us. Great. Thank you. Yeah, such a, a difficult situation, but, but so important for folks who might be experiencing that type of harassment to reach out to somebody, your local fair housing organization, or the folks at the DOJ. So thank you so much, Sheena. We'll talk with you again um, during the, the, the Q&A. So we'll transition a little bit over to a, a, a diff slightly different lane that we're seeing in the pandemic to uh, hear from Brian Green and start to talk about these sort of unique experiences that we're starting to see in this virtual world like we're in right now that we're seeing in the real estate industry. Um, it's it's um, you know, showings and you know, meeting with clients. And so uh, you know, Brian will talk a little bit about uh, what, what's occurring there during the pandemic. And you know, my sense is that as all of us keep saying, we're we're not gonna return back to normal. So these may be pieces of, of practices that we see into the future as our world stays virtual um, from here on out. So Brian, uh, welcome. Thank you, Alan. Um, so, you know, uh, the pandemic um, really in many respects has uh, been able to focus a light on some issues that have been there all along um, and it's exacerbated others. Uh, we certainly know, uh, you know, from a health perspective that the pandemic just underscored uh, just how 
Um, we have great disparities in the kinds of jobs that uh, people of color are doing uh, versus the rest of society, uh, which has made them more vulnerable um, to exposure uh, from COVID. Um, but we also know that um, you know, health disparities uh, in the United States has also made those populations more vulnerable. And um, really just, I think, uh, us being home and consuming this information and more information um, has also uh, made us all much more aware of that. Um, and then of course, this past year, we've gone through um, sort of uh, what people uh, have referred to as a reckoning with race in our society, which has uh, helped many people, including many in the housing industry, um, better understand um, the historical impact of um, discrimination and segregation on communities of color and how that has led uh, to um, disinvested communities, uh, has led to uh, greater crime in some communities and others, uh, and has helped leasing figures into all of that. Uh, so this really, for, for all of us, has been um, uh, a year and change for us to really reflect on this. Uh, and no place uh, is, um, the, the realtors are is no different from any other place in that regard. In fact, uh, our president of the National Association of Realtors um, took the opportunity on his inauguration as president of the realtors uh, to apologize for the role of the National Association of Realtors in creating uh, a legacy of segregation in our country and uh, what that has uh, left and uh, expressed the, the realtor's commitment um, both in practice and in policy uh, to help uh, redress those harms. And so we've been actively engaged in all of those things um, before the pandemic and certainly since. Um, I joined the National Association of Realtors just a few months before the pandemic uh, where I launched um, an effort called ACT, um, which is an acronym for Accountability, Culture Change, and Training, where our focus has been uh, all of the efforts that we will undertake uh, to ensure not only that real estate agents have the best training when it comes to fair housing, but that we work on um, the culture in our industry uh, to prioritize fair housing and to uh, integrate it into everything that we do. Um, but uh, finally, to ensure accountability when people violate the fair housing laws. So all of these things have been a priority. Um, and this has included, <clears throat> among other things, um, a priority on testing, um, both uh, our support for the testing that uh, Sheena and the Department of Justice do, that uh, Lisa Rice and the National Fair Housing Alliance does, uh, and um, all the other private fair housing groups that HUD supports through the Fair Housing Initiatives Program. Um, we are uh, advocating for increased funding for that testing uh, because that is really the most effective way of uh, proving discrimination uh, in both the real estate industry and uh, in the, the multifamily uh, rental market. Uh, and we're also supporting increased funding for HUD uh, to do more um, in terms of enforcement, both in terms of proactive investigations uh, and their investigations of individual complaints of discrimination. This is a priority for the National Association of Realtors uh, because just like any, just like a trade association like uh, the American Medical Association, we don't want quacks out there claiming to be part of our profession when uh, they are not living up to our ethics. So, um, so that's significant. We're also working with um, the real estate associations in different states to create stronger laws um, for licensing real estate professionals and stronger consequences when real estate professionals violate the law. So, you know, in addition to you know what the Fair Housing Act requires, uh, we want to be sure that uh, state licensing bodies. Um, take action when there are real estate agents who engage in discrimination. So already uh, some review that we've done of these different state licensing laws 
has led to new proposals to strengthen those laws. Um, and that all has happened in this past year. Uh, so, so those are major efforts in terms of accountability. Uh, we're highlighting um, many of our real estate um, champions. Uh, I don't know how many of you uh, had the opportunity last week uh, to watch a Fair Housing Month program that we put on, um, but uh, Secretary Marsha Fudge from HUD joined us uh, along with the Martin Luther King Memorial Foundation um, to speak about uh, what we are doing at the National Association of Realtors. And uh, there we also featured several um, real estate leaders throughout the country uh, who are changing uh, um, the landscape in their communities when it comes to fair housing. And so that's an effort that we're continuing to do because we really do believe that uh, real estate professionals um, follow the example of others and uh, that that is very helpful uh, in our communities. And then finally, uh, we are increasing our training uh, to real estate professionals. Uh, you know, we recognize that uh, uh, a strong foundation is essential and that classroom instruction on fair housing is not enough. Uh, so we created an innovative new training program called Fair Haven, which is um, an online simulation program where real estate agents uh, are faced with different uh, situations that they have to navigate and ensure that they are following the law and uh, address discrimination that they may see others commit. Uh, the simulation also puts real estate agents in the seat of the consumer, say a person of color or a person with a disability uh, so that they can see what uh, people of different backgrounds encounter in situations and they have to evaluate uh, whether real estate agents uh, handle those situations properly. So they literally, uh, well, not literally, but they, uh, in this simulation, they are uh, visiting this community of Fairhaven uh, where there are different neighborhoods and, uh, you know, neighborhoods that have different demography where um, they have to navigate situations much like they would in the real world and ensure that they're upholding fair housing standards. And so that's gotten rave reviews as a, a different way of teaching fair housing. And so with people being home uh, and doing much more online, uh, this has been a great um, new way to train. Um, and all of these things, by the way, you can find on our website at nar.realtor slash fair housing. So you can find Fairhaven uh, there and you can find likewise um, this program I described from last week. We also have some implicit bias training that we've done, um, uh, an overview of that training there on the website. So, so those are sort of, you know, while this is a huge effort uh, act, um, I also describe that as the bare minimum um, because that is really sort of do no harm. That is what, um, since the passage of the Fair Housing Act, uh, what all housing providers really are obligated to do. Um, uh, I'm the vice president for policy advocacy. Uh, and so what I'm also advancing is a policy that will uh, further fair housing. And this recognizes that fair housing really is implicated in all housing policy. And how could it not be in a country, um, you know, where we have segregation and where real estate is about location, location, location. So um, fair housing really is becoming an integral part of how we look at uh, policy overall. And we're ensuring that uh, fair housing is in the mix whenever we discuss housing policy, whether it be tax or uh, federal housing policy or environmental concerns or other business issues. So it's, um, it's integral. Um, but I wanna underscore something else uh, that we've seen during this pandemic. And that is, we've seen very high demand for housing uh, in a market where there's very tight supply. So uh, we uh, you know, have advocated for a number of efforts that would help first time home buyers compete in uh, the marketplace, uh, such as uh, tax credits for first time home buyers. So they would have more for down payments 
Uh, we're also exploring other down payment assistance. All of these things uh, are important. Alternative credit, for example, uh, to help more people qualify. All of these things are very important. And pre-pandemic, uh, they provided a fighting chance for most consumers. Now it's becoming incredibly hard, even if you qualify uh, and have the down payment, because housing prices have gone high up because of uh, the, uh, the, the, the shortage of housing in our marketplace. Uh, and that's affected people of all backgrounds, but it's having re really acute effects on people of color. And, um, you know, if you consider the fact that uh, people of color disproportionately rely on uh, FHA loans uh, in this market <clears throat> with an FHA loan or even a VA loan, it's very uh, challenging uh, to compete with cash offers that are waiving inspections and uh, escalating prices by $100,000 to $200,000 uh, for multiple offers on properties. So this is proving to be a challenge. Uh, we've seen this past year that in a country where African Americans represent 13% of the population, uh, they represented only 5% of new home buyers. Um, and that really has been uh, mostly reflected in purchases by upper and middle class uh, black millennials. Uh, Latinos represent 18% of the American population, um, but only 7% of recent home buyers. And Asian Americans, 7% of the population, and only 5% of uh, new home buyers. So um, acutely affected by this housing shortage. And we're, we're seeing, you know, uh, a lot of the, the, the housing purchases at really the higher end of the market. Uh, the percentage of homes selling for $300,000 or more uh, has doubled uh, in this past year. So this is something that we have to address because until we address this, <clears throat> a lot of the other issues, um, a lot of the other uh, efforts we have underway to address the legacy of discrimination, you know, the alternative credit, the um, down payment assistance and other programs for first time home buyers um, become stalled just because there, there isn't the housing um, for people to um, to seek out. Um, so this is an area where we are trying to uh, find different tools to promote greater housing supply. No doubt as the realtors, we don't build houses, but of course um, we uh, advocate policy that may influence that. Uh, one way to increase the housing supply uh, for first time home buyers is to provide incentives for those who own homes to sell their homes to first time home buyers. So we've advocated uh, a cut in capital gains tax for those sellers of property who sell to first time home buyers as opposed to say investors. Uh, so that would potentially spur um, more supply going to first time home buyers. Uh, we've also recommended that uh, the commercial properties, many commercial properties during this pandemic uh, have, have sat empty <laughs> and will possibly continue to sit empty uh, as more people um, work remotely. We've suggested that uh, many of those properties can be converted to housing and that we could provide a tax credit um, to those uh, owners of commercial properties who will convert that housing, um, sorry, that, uh, those properties to housing. And so that could help increase uh, the supply. Likewise, uh, encouraging uh, persons who currently have renters um, in say single family houses to sell homes to those renters for uh, a tax benefit, um, convert essentially existing renters into uh, home buyers. Um, so do all that we can in the short term with the existing housing supply to prioritize first time home buyers uh, in those properties. Uh, but then also do what we can to promote greater housing construction. And we could even support um, uh, training for um, the construction industry through tax incentives. Um, finally, uh, we need just more favorable zoning and regulation at the local level that would allow for duplexes and single family zones uh, or, or other multifamily property and single fam family zones so that we could have more housing. Um, 
but we're probably a decade or more behind where we need to be in terms of housing construction in this country. Uh, and we're going to require, uh, we're going to need very bold steps uh, if we are going to meet the challenge, if we're going to meet the demand right now um, for home ownership. Uh, the last thing I'll say is we also want to make sure that when people get into home ownership, that they enjoy the full benefits of home ownership. And one thing that we've seen uh, a lot of stories about this past year has been um, appraisal discrimination. And uh, the reports of this have taken sort of two forms, um, discrimination against persons, uh, uh, discrimination against persons based on the race of the occupant in the house, uh, as well as discrimination um, based on the community. Uh, we've seen a number of situations where biracial um, couples have lived in a home and uh, African, African American person will be present for an appraisal. This will be like a refinance. An African American uh, spouse will be home for the appraisal and the appraisal will come in at one number, which would appear low. And then the couple will order a reappraisal uh, when uh, only the white person, the white spouse is home and will come in 50% higher. I've seen in this past year, three news stories involving this kind of situation. Uh, and you know, in, in one of the, 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 the uh, stories, it appeared that uh, the, the home was on the border of two communities, uh, one predominantly black, one predominantly white. And depending on the spouse who was home, the cops uh, allegedly were drawn from communities that corresponded to the race of the spouse who is at home. <laughs> and so we have a problem that we need to address there in terms of appraisers and whether appraisers uh, are uh, making these valuations based on bias. Uh, so that's one issue we have to deal with in appraisals. But then beyond that, uh, we have allegations from folks like Andre Perry at the Brookings Institute and others that there's a systematic problem or rather a systemic problem that we have um, African-American communities and other communities of color devalued, that comparable homes in African-American communities versus white communities are uh, valued at lower rates, uh, lower prices. And so we need to look at that issue as well um, so that uh, we can be sure that whole communities aren't being devalued. And that requires uh, the work of um, really everyone in the housing industry. It involves the government-sponsored enterprises, involves the lenders, uh, and, uh, and others in the housing industry. We are not appraisers at the National Association of Realtors, but we do have 25,000 uh, appraisal members among our 1.4 million members. Um, so we do take a great interest in this, uh, especially since uh, we are advocates for home ownership. And this uh, issue would suggest that not everyone's gaining the full value of home ownership that they should. So this is... Uh, Yet one other issue that this pandemic has brought to light this past year has been very illuminating for all of us. Uh, and I'm uh, just glad to say that uh, I, I uh, appreciate the partnership of housing industry and advocates to address these issues. Thanks. Thank you so much, Brian. Really appreciate all that you said. And, and, and I do have to say, I also really appreciate how the realtors are showing up in this moment and how intentionally you all are thinking about solutions that, that come and touch on your industry. Um, and, you know, having uh, come from Oregon out here, you know, you might have seen in the headlines, we are that, that, that state that um, ended uh, exclusionary single family residential zoning with uh, duplexes, triplexes and other middle housing types. And so um, here at the Fair Housing Council of Oregon, we've been involved in that discussion and definitely see that as an opportunity to bring this fair housing perspective and fair housing concepts forward at work. And it's been a, a really engaging discussion to talk about community housing types. I've also been uh, interacting with our, um, I've also been interacting with our local um, uh, realtors here. And I, I actually gave a presentation last year about uh, discrimination uh, throughout the pandemic. And I'm actually um, returning to speak with their Realtor Advisory Committee tomorrow. So really appreciate the interaction with, uh, with the industry. All right, well, with that, we're going to, um, 
move on now to hear more about what's happening in the marketplace on the industry side and pass it over to Nicole Apano from the um, uh, National Apartment Association to talk about what we're seeing in the pandemic and the specific issues that are coming up uh, right now for um, where we are in the marketplace. So take it away, Nicole, thank you. Thank you, Alan. I am really excited to be with all of you today and thank you to NAFA for having me as part of this esteemed panel, uh, panel during Fair Housing Month. If you'll just bear with me for one moment, I am going to uh, share my slides. Well, of course, when <laughs> technology um, is causing issues and we checked this earlier, hopefully you can see this now. Yeah, it clicked on for a second there, Nicole. Yeah, I'm not sure what's going on. My sincere apologies for this hiccup. Yeah, we can see it now. Okay, great. Um, so like Alan said, for my portion of the presentation, uh, as, as you know, wearing my National Apartment Association hat today, um, I just wanted to share some of the trends that rental housing owners and management uh, firms are you know, seeing in the industry and how that sort of intersects with fair housing, new fair housing requirements and fair housing laws and how we help our members operationalize these new requirements and stay compliant. So in light of COVID, I think that really accelerated the shift for, you know, we represent the small mom and pop owners that are family run businesses and maybe have one or two employees to the very large multi-state uh, regional or national management companies. And it's very much varied in how they're approaching the pandemic and the resources that they have available to them. Uh, but we are seeing certainly a rise in virtual and self-guided tours. And this is a trend that you know, we've been seeing in terms of maintenance requests and package con concierge services, um, you know, meeting our customers where they are. And if that, that also could mean providing them with an online platform to do a self-guided tour, to you know, uh, type in their information all in a web or app-based application, uh, allow the resident to access a lockbox and for the staff to secure the unit remotely post tour and to do everything uh, through that online platform. Um, as I mentioned on the right side, we are seeing certainly an, an increase and there is an added benefit to moving towards this virtual system. But in light of you know, new HUD requirements, we always wanna make sure that we're providing equal opportunity to anyone who comes through that virtual door or into the leasing office as well. So I'm sure you all know and have seen that a couple of months ago, HUD announced that they will be enforcing the Fair Housing Act to prohibit discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. And these are not new protected classes, but instead an expanded interpretation of the protections afforded under sex as a protected class. And I bring this up just to sort of um, lead into whether you're filling out a guest card or uh, you know, a, a contact card for someone who wants to tour the property or checking an online form to verify the identity of someone who wants to do a self-guided tour. While we understand there are, you know, privacy and security considerations that you want to consider, but you also want to consider the fair housing implications as well. So there may be times when you're communicating with a trans applicant and their physical appearance and the name they've given don't match their ID. And this is the situation, this is an example of a situation where the new protections for gender identity could come into play. And I just encourage you to, you know, document accordingly on the on the contact card or your forms that you've made an exception to an ID check and you know list their preferred name on the form, make sure you're um, being respectful of their preferred name and contacting them appropriately for future vacancies and just making sure that this discrepancy and personally identifiable information doesn't become a barrier to a trans applicant in terms of doing a tour, filling out an application 
or by extension in terms of your screening procedures as well. Whether, you know, like, like I said, there, there's a full breadth of folks that are involved in rental housing as an owner or a manager. So whether you're, you're doing these processes yourself or you're relying on a third party company that's operating your app and helping you with the criteria that go along with that, just making sure there's consistency there and you're making appropriate exceptions to make sure that you're still allowing for equal housing opportunity. Another shift that we're seeing is, and as you all know this, there's a shift in housing policy around the country to make sure that we're preserving housing access and housing choice for folks who've especially been affected by the pandemic and um, making sure that we're expanding access to, to areas of opportunity for renters and for homeowners as well. Um, so just to set the stage in terms of resident screening, uh, like I said, we've got a, a certainly a varied mix of independent owners versus the large companies. Some of them are making decisions and relying on best practices that they're, they're hearing or getting from their peers, or they're relying on, for bigger companies, uh, an entire legal team or someone to help them sort of craft their policies. But we want to make sure that um, you're considering how you evaluate a renter's criminal history, their eviction history, or financial history in the application screening process. And again, to make sure that there's consistency, whether that's in your own processes or you're working through a third party company that may be relying on, they may have you know, a resident scoring tool or some other feature to help you in your screening process. And just to set the stage, this is nothing new. Um, you know, housing providers, it's a constant balancing act to make sure that they're instituting clear policies and screening criteria and, and really investing in fair housing training to reduce the risk of human error or unconscious bias entering into the process of becoming a factor. And this has to be balanced with the fact that um, rightly the um, this is prohibited, but that broad sweeping policies have the potential to disproportionately affect renters of color and other populations of renters that are protected by the Fair Housing Act. So, you know, we certainly discourage our members from instituting blanket bans and for housing providers to make thoughtful de decisions and being very clear about the specific business reasons for including certain factors in your criteria. Um, and what I've heard from a lot of members and is a good backstop as well, is to make sure that, well, I understand there's some hesitation there in doing individualized ass assessments and making case by case decisions um, in light of you know, trying to have clear policies. One uh, back, good backstop is to have a process for applicants to contest a denial so that they're able to provide that additional information that um, you know, may sway your decision and help provide some context to a particular issue in their screening history. And you know, for us, we know this is essential in terms of the, the new disparate impact rule and how that will be implemented um, just to make sure that, again, you know, there's, there's a lot of variation between no screening and blanket bans, but where is the um, making sure that there's a, a clear line of what, what is lawful and what is unlawful. I think that's, that's an area where our members have some hesitation and are nervous about. So one other thing I'll mention on the other slide is I know some folks are using resident scoring tools or others are uh, using a third party company to help them with their screening. Uh, we certainly wanted to say that models, these models that the algorithms are based off of must be benchmarked against industry practice and used appropriately. And again, that there's some consistency there and whether you're using a third party, man, third party company to do your screening, or again, you're a small shop and you're, you're doing this process yourself, just making sure that you're going through that very deliberative process to understand what are the valid business reasons to, to consider some factors in the screening process and being very thoughtful in that process. So 
my comments are actually very short. I just wanted to you know, go through a couple of the things that we're looking at, some of the trends that we're seeing and how that aligns with how we're helping our members you know, operationalize some of these issues. But um, in addition to all the great resources that NASA offers, of course, we wanted to offer up our resources as well that we have on our website um, to help with fair housing training or any other issues that have come up in light of the pandemic, uh, vac vaccination policies and other things. Um, those are things that we're working on to help provide value to the industry and, um, you know, hopefully be a leading authority alongside NASA on housing issues. That is all for my presentation, Alan. I think I'll turn things back over to you unless there are any questions. Thanks so much, Nicole. Uh, no, we will. I think we're going to head over to the question and the answer period here after our next presenter. So I don't have any specific ones um, for you, but again, I, I do appreciate the partnership uh, with you and the uh, housing providers, as I sometimes like to remind folks that um, there is no fair housing without housing. So um, we definitely need uh, to have partners in all of the industries and, and so grateful for, for the information that you provided this morning. Um, I wanna uh, transition now over to um, our president and CEO at, um, at the National Fair Housing Alliance. So um, Lisa will um, kind of bring us home on all the different topics and all of that we are seeing and hearing in the pandemic. Um, and then we'll switch over to Q&A after we hear from Lisa. Hi, Lisa, good afternoon. Hey, Alan, thank you so very much. And I, I just wanna take a moment to thank our audience uh, for joining us. We have over 600 participants for this event, which is just incredible. And I think is a testament to the fact that um, we all wanna to work together in partnership to advance fair housing opportunities. I want to uh, share my screen and I hope that uh, you all are able to see my PowerPoint presentation. If not, can you please let me know, Alan, if you're not seeing it? We see it there, Lisa, thank you. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Okay, great, great. And okay, are you still able to see my slide? Oh, something. Yeah, good, yes. Okay, perfect, perfect. So I just wanted to um, comment about Okay, there, there we go. I'm sorry, I'm trying to get things situ situated. Um, I just wanted to um, acknowledge that I am sitting in Washington, D.C., the home of the Piscataway tribe, the Pat Piscataway Coney tribe, um, which is the tribe that, that has uh, cared for and managed these lands for so many centuries and just wanted to acknowledge that we're able to be here today because um, of, their, of their care and concern over these lands. Um, and wanted to start out my presentation by uh, really talking about the uh, issues that we're addressing um, and that we're seeing related to the COVID pandemic across the United States of America. Uh, and, and recognizing that really, um, where you live matters, uh, and, and recognizing that the COVID pandemic is happening and unfolding against this, um, not, not against a blank uh, sort of canvas, but happening against a backdrop that uh, is deeply inequitable, a landscape that is very uh, segregated. And so when you think about uh, so many of the things that impact our lives, uh, it's important to uh, consider that um, the COVID pandemic is all of these areas that we think about in terms of our wealth access or our education access, um, our ability to access credit, our, our ability to access broadband, and, and live a life that, um, you, you know, that is as undisrupted as it can be in this pandemic um, is, is greatly connected to the, the, the fact that, that we have an uh, inequitable landscape. 
and that we live in a society that is deeply segregated. We're more segregated today than we were a hundred years ago. Uh, and so when you think about things uh, like people's ability to uh, just access healthcare, we recognize that um, folks don't have the ability to access um, healthcare uh, because healthcare facilities are not equitably distributed uh, across the United States uh, in communities of color. Uh, one, one research um, uh, study by um, Zillow uh, shows that uh, in many areas, communities of color have 40% fewer healthcare facilities than do uh, predominantly white neighborhoods. Um, your zip code is actually a better predictor of your health than your genetic code. Um, and, and so we're, we're dealing with all of these other sort of related issues against this very uh, inequitable backstop. One of the uh, champions of fair housing, a longtime colleague of mine and uh, a leader in the fair housing movement, Fred Freiberg, who runs the Fair Housing Justice Center of New York has said for so many years, uh, as long as I've known him, that housing discrimination and segregation are killing people. And I think the COVID pandemic really uh, makes this point live, right? We're seeing that um, COVID infection rates, the hospitalization rates and the death rates um, are much, much higher for communities of color than they are for predominantly white communities. Um, when it comes to hospitalization rates, the hospitalization rate for uh, American Indians, uh, Alaskan uh, natives is almost four times higher than it is for um, white residents. When we look at the death rates, uh, African Americans, uh, Native Indians, uh, Latinos are dying from the coronavirus at uh, more, almost more than twice, in some cases, twice the rate or more than uh, two times the rate of that for um, uh, predominantly uh, white, uh, for, for white residents. Um, and these, these impacts, I mean, the, the, the higher death rates, uh, the higher hospitalization rates, they have long-term impacts. Right, because if you're hospitalized for the virus, uh, if you are experiencing a death in your family, um, you know that is that is going to have long-term impact impacts in terms of your uh, ability to be gainfully employed. It's going to have long-term impacts on uh, your housing stability. It's going to have impacts on your family wealth. I uh, so I just wanted to remind us that. What we're talking about today is, um, you know, we're not just talking about the impacts of COVID on housing, but we're really talking about the impacts of COVID and the implications of COVID for every, literally every area and aspect of our life. Uh, and to have uh, um, families to have to deal with discrimination on top of that just really makes it that much worse for so many people in our society. We're also seeing uh, disproportionate outcomes uh, at, because of the coronavirus uh, pandemic on people's housing uh, security and housing stability. So homeowners are behind on their mortgages. Uh, homeowners of color, excuse me, are behind on their mortgages um, for African-Americans and Latinos, uh, three times the rate of white households Asian Americans in the United States are behind on their uh, mortgage, uh, twice the rate of white households. When we look at rental housing payments, we see that Hispanics, uh, African Americans, excuse me, and Asian Americans are, uh, are behind on their rent at uh, more than twice the rate of, of white households. Uh, non-Hispanic white households. Um, and, and so I just wanted to pause here for a, a moment because I, I, I think that, you know, we all sort of have this, this notion that the federal government, you know, responded 
uh, right after the pandemic happened, responded very quickly with the CARES Act, and that folks are, are getting uh, forbearances under the CARES Act and they're able to stay in their homes and not be subject to foreclosure you know, at basically the same rate. So like everybody has equal access to forbearance. Um, I, I think also because of the eviction moratoriums, we have that same sense too that, right, that um, everybody has the ability to stay sta stably housed through this pandemic. And um, I just wanted to point out that that's not necessarily the case. We are clearly seeing that um, when it comes to home ownership, uh, when it comes to owner-occupied uh, housing units, uh, all consumers, all members of our society are not able to access a forbearance at the same rate. Uh, so this, is, this data that I'm showing you right now is from the US uh, census data from the Pulse survey. Uh, it's the latest um, issuance from the Pulse survey. And you can see there, um, we, we, I just discussed the differences uh, the disparities with you. Uh, but it, it also reflects, I think, in, and, and supports research by the Urban Institute, which shows that homo, excuse me, homeowners in predominantly Black and Latino zip codes are disproportionately not protected by uh, fair, forbearance programs uh, when you compare them to homeowners in predominantly white communities. So we're, we're seeing unequal access to the protections uh, we thought we were all getting on an equitable basis under the CARES Act. And I think the disparities in accessing forbearance protection uh, relates back to that first slide that I showed you, right? where you live matters. Now, I, I, I just wanted to also point out that when it comes to fair housing implications, you know, fair housing organizations are, uh, have to be particularly um, aware of, of this issue, right? Whether or not uh, homeowners of color um, and renters of color are getting the same access to protections uh, under the CARES Act and under um, the rescue plan and other laws, even state laws that have been put in place to provide um, protection and support for people um, 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 who are impacted by the COVID crisis. Uh, and paying attention to that, I mean, that can be very difficult, right? Because it can be difficult to get data and information about who is not getting a forbearance. Uh, and I think this is where, uh, I think this is where education and outreach really comes into play. We've, we've all got to be out there, uh, housing providers, fair housing groups, uh, FAP organizations, FIP organizations, we all have to be out there really pounding the pavement and educating consumers to let them know that uh, they do have the opportunity to get a forbearance under, um, under uh, the CARES Act. And if they're not getting a forbearance, you know, or if they're, getting, they're being discouraged from getting a forbearance that they need to connect with their local fair housing organizations or, or they need to connect with HUD so that they are raising the alarm and letting folks know that, hey, I, I, I'm trying to get a forbearance, but I cannot get one. But we are finding that a lot of consumers don't even know that forbearance is an option for them. And so it's really important for us to, um, um, to sound the alarm, you know, to, to let people know that these options and rights are available to them. I also wanted to just note briefly that the CFPB did just recently issue uh, just the other day, um, um, a rule to support the CDC's uh, eviction moratorium, uh, and it's I think it's a no, it, it's a rule that that um, um, is really important because what what it explains and what it says is that uh, you know all 
all renters need to be told, all renters who are being subject to eviction need to be told about their, uh, their rights under uh, the eviction uh, moratorium. And if they're not told about their rights, that can raise some serious, um, that can raise some serious concerns. And it also means that, you know, HUD, the CFPB, um, the FTC are paying attention to uh, this issue and, they're, and are there to help support um, consumers. And so that, that's, that's really important. Um, uh, let me also point um, that point out that the National Housing, uh, the, the National Fair Housing Alliance, uh, NAR, um, and a number of organizations really pushed hard with Congress to get a homeowner's assistance fund and a renter's assistance fund included in this last COVID relief package. And, uh, you know, initially the signs were, were there indicating that we were not going to get any relief for, um, for consumers, but we did get it. And I, I just wanted to caution everybody who's on the, the phone, on the call now to let you know um, that the Treasury Department did release the application form for your state or your territory uh, or your tribe to uh, submit an application to the Treasury Department to get uh, funds disseminated to your state, to your territory under the Homeowners Assistance Fund. But the, the deadline, I believe, is April the 25th. I think that's what the deadline is, if my memory serves me correct. Um, somebody please keep me honest on that. Um, but it's important to flag that because if you, if you don't submit your application for funds, your state, your, your territory will not get the funds. And the funds that would have been designated for your community will be sent to another state. So you want to make sure that you're reaching out to your governor, that you're reaching out to your state housing uh, uh, finance fund, your, your uh, state housing finance agency to make sure that they have submitted the application and have the confirmation that the application has been received. And I just wanted to close out um, by teeing up a couple of emerging issues that we're seeing uh, in the fair housing space. Brian already talked about uh, appraisal bias uh, issues, tremendously important. Our fair housing groups are seeing an uptick, an increase in uh, appraisal bias cases. This is extremely important. As Brian noted, we are experiencing a very robust uh, real estate housing market. It, it's very, very robust. I think, you know, it actually caught a lot of people by surprise because people were comparing, trying to compare this crisis to the Great Recession. The thing I think that, that we really didn't fully appreciate when this pandemic hit is that, and I don't know if a lot of people realize this, but during the Great Recession, we lost 5 million. We lost 5 million owner-occupied units. We lost 5 million houses were taken off of the market and, and transferred to rental from home ownership to rental. And so that home ownership market has been really, really tight. Uh, and so people's ability to stay stably housed is really predicated on you know, can I get a refinance loan and lower uh, my housing payment because the income may have been impacted by COVID? So you want to lower your housing payment. There are a lot of people who wanted to take advantage of this low interest rate environment. Uh, you go to get your appraisal to try and get your refinance and your home doesn't appraise out. So this appraisal bias issue can literally mean the difference between a, a family being able to stay in their house or losing uh, their, their housing stability. It also, of course, impacts uh, wealth, family wealth, which we know is so critical uh, in, in these trying times. I've already talked about uh, unequal access to mortgage forbearance and uh, the eviction crisis, but I, I did wanna uh, touch on two other issues. One is 
uh, gentrification and displacement. Again, very, very tight housing market. Uh, and a lot of people, we're seeing housing prices surge in so many areas. Uh, and so people are getting squeezed. Uh, and so fair housing groups and housing providers, I think are gonna have to work together, particularly under the rubric of AFFH in order to, to help protect people's housing rights. Uh, and then finally, tech bias. So, you know, we all, all of the speakers have been talking about all of the different ways that communities of color, women, people with disabilities are disproportionately being impacted by this COVID uh, crisis, right? And it's not just a COVID crisis. It's not just a health crisis, right? We're, we're in the throes of not just the health crisis, but an economic crisis and the crisis of racism that has plagued us since before the inception of this nation. So that's all coming right to convergence. Uh, and it, it will have implications in the data, right? <laughs> As we, we're seeing employment impacts, we're seeing healthcare impacts, we're seeing educational impacts, we're seeing credit impacts, we're seeing impacts along all of these lines, right? Going back to that original slide that I showed at the beginning of, of my presentation, all of those areas are, 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 you know, people are being impacted in all of those areas disproportionately. And that disproportionate impact is in the data and it will be reflected in the data going forward. And it will be then um, uh, picked up in our tenant screening selection systems, our risk-based pricing systems, our credit scoring systems. And so that's why it's important for us to really pay attention to this issue of tech bias and really work um, to uh, uh, mitigate against disparities in these algorithmic-based systems to make sure that people have fair access. So with that, again, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, I think I'm gonna turn it back over to Alan for the Q&A. Great, thank you so much, Lisa. Um, that really brings it all together in highlighting how important our work together in the fair housing movement is today and really how interrelated all of these pieces of work are to end racial segregation in so many of these different areas that we've touched on today. Again, it also really highlights how fair housing is this vital pathway forward in creating some truly resilient communities so that when we experience our next crisis, that these inequities aren't repeating themselves. So it's such a vital, vital um, opportunity for us to talk about all these issues today. So we'll just reset for just a quick moment. Everybody take a deep breath and we're gonna launch into some questions that have come from our audience here today. Um, let me fire off the first one here and it will be probably best for, um, for uh, Secretary, uh, for Janine and Lisa and, and possibly Sheena to answer here. Um, the question is around, is HUD or NAFA tracking the number of eviction judgments that are occurring during the COVID moratorium, but have not yet been enforced, right? Lots of places, including where we are, courts are closed, right? So are HUD or NAFA determining whether those individuals that are impacted are disproportionately going to be coming from certain protected classes? So question about what we might see um, around evictions when we come out of the um, moratoriums. So either um, Janine or, or Lisa want to address whether or not you all are tracking those issues? I can, I can start out and then lob it over to Janine. So the National Fair Housing Alliance, we're not tracking all evictions uh, throughout the United States. I know that in some states and some communities, some of our fair housing organizations are tracking uh, evictions and have evictions uh, initiatives. Um, um, so if whoever answer, asked the question, um, you might wanna reach out to your local fair housing organization to see if this is something that they're tracking at the local level. Um, also, if, if you wanna look into this issue, um, um, Matthew Desmond and the evictions lab, um, they have been uh, maintaining an evictions database 
that captures uh, eviction trends. Uh, and so you might want to check out the evictions lab uh, database. I think it's housed at Princeton to get information for your local community. Alan, I think you're on mute. There we go. You think after a year I'd know how to use this thing, huh? Uh, Janine, anything that you wanted to add from HUD's perspective about um, tracking uh, evictions? And you're on mute if you're there, but um, if not, we're happy to open it up to others. And, um, maybe um, Sheena from DOJ, if you've got any input on that, um, about what you might be tracking or seeing from the DOJ perspectives. Um, well, we're not tracking the data, but I, I also was going to, to um, uh, refer the, the person who called in or, or wrote in to the, the eviction lab, which is the, you know, the data set there is very useful. It goes back to 2000. And so I'm sure with different queries, you could answer that specific question of the trend or difference in evictions over the last year. Okay. Let's say we've heard anecdotal reports, but it's not a comprehensive sort of data set that would allow us to do a different impact analysis, for example. Yeah, and for us as a, as a qualified fair housing organization out in Oregon, I think we see the same thing. I think anecdotally, that's what we're expecting, but we're not um, tracking it either. And Ginny, it looks like you un, unmuted. Do you want to uh, pop in here on, on HUD's perspective? Oh, except we can't hear. No. Still can't hear you. It looks like you're unmuted, but we can't hear your voice, unfortunately. Can you hear me now? There you go. All Thank right. you. <laughs> I didn't hear the question. I'm sorry. Around, uh, it's around um, whether or not HUD is tracking the number of eviction judgments that have occurred during the more COVID moratorium, but have not yet been enforced. And do we expect that we might see um, impacts disproportionately on certain protected classes when we see those evictions start to move through the process? So we aren't um, we aren't tracking the numbers specifically, but we do definitely expect to see uh, impacts that disproportionately affect people of certain races, colors, or national origins. And we'll be watching that as we come out of the eviction moratorium to see what actions we can take to remedy the situation. Great, thank you. Alan, this is, sorry, this is Nicole with NAI. Oh, I think you. the Legal Services Corporation um, had a congressional mandate to track evictions as well. I've been involved in those conversations, but that might be another way to track the data. Great, thank you. Yeah, uh, same for us in, the, in, the, in Oregon, our legal aid partners are, are, tend to be tracking some of that more closely too. So I think those would be good folks uh, in your area to reach out to. I also wanted to, return to kind of a more general question before we look at some of the specific questions that have come up around um, the vaccinations and COVID-19. Somebody asked about whether a housing provider can ask tenants if they've either had or have had COVID-19, you know, have, have um, tested positive, or if they've actually been vaccinated. Are those the kinds of questions that housing providers can ask of their residents? Um, and maybe that's something for, for Janine to start out on. And then we maybe would wanna hear from the housing provider folks to see what, what folks are experiencing uh, there. Happy to uh, give a shot at answering that one. So under the Fair Housing Act, there are very specific limitations on the types of inquiries that housing providers can ask. Specifically, uh, housing providers uh, are not able to ask questions that may impinge upon a person's medical privacy or relate to a person's disability, unless disability is a qualification for living in the specific type of housing. And the reason that exception is there is because HUD, for example, operates some housing programs where uh, the funding is for certain groups of individuals with disabilities. So housing providers who operate that kind of housing need to ensure that the residents have a qualifying disability 
other than that, uh, it's a dangerous area for housing providers to get into to ask about people's health status uh, because that um, immediately raises a red flag about disability. The other concern that housing providers need to have is that um, uh, there is disproportionate access uh, to vaccines. Some people do not have the same ready access to health care, as I believe it was Lisa pointed out earlier. And the other issue is that there are actually people who, for disability related reasons, are not able to have a vaccine or because of faith related reasons associated with their religion cannot have a vaccine. And so you could have a, a policy that had a discriminatory effect that would be problematic under the Fair Housing Act. Thank you, Janine. And Nicole, would you mind weighing in from, from your um, industry's perspective? Sure. You know, I, I think Janine pretty well covered it. I know we did do a best practice on vaccinations, but it covered a lot of these different factors that would um, interfere or make it less likely that you would you would create that mandate for your residents or your for your employees either. So I'm, I'm surprised to hear that. Thank you. Yeah, and there's some other questions about you know different staff members and personnel, and, and so certainly I think looking at the best practices that are out there and the intersections with fair housing, I think would be important for, for housing providers right now. Thanks. Anybody else wanted to add anything on that before we moved on to another question? Great, thank you. So let's move on to a specific question that came in for Brian around the um, real estate uh, um, industry. And the, the question starts out, thanks for acknowledging the fair housing implications and concerns regarding the increasing consolidation of property in the hands of a few larger corporations and investors at the expense of, of families that we've seen. Down in California, apparently there's been a bill that has uh, worked to try to address this. But the uh, question that person asked the question indicated that the California realtors oppose this legislation while a number of other realtor or realtist groups, they said here, support it. Is there a role for the um, National Association of Realtors here in this? And is this something that, that you all have um, thought about or talked about? So um, our state associations, we're sort of a federated system. And so our state associations are the ones who weigh in on state legislation. Um, uh, let me also just make clear precisely what I was talking about. Uh, and thank you, Kevin, for the question. Happy to follow up with you separately, too. Um, the, the issue I'm raising isn't uh, investor owners in housing. It is uh, we are advocating that uh, housing providers or owners of housing sell uh, to first time home buyers uh, and that we give them tax incentives if they sell to first time home buyers, uh, you know, as opposed to someone who's going to, uh, you know, buy that as a second home or as an investment property. So we're not talking about even corporations. We're talking about if you've got a house and uh, you're moving and you intend to sell it, uh, normally you would pay significant tax or capital gains tax on that, um, you know, if it's your, your house or an investment property. But because first time home buyers can't find housing to buy, we would give you um, uh, a tax cut if you sold it to them. So we're not even really talking about corporations here necessarily. Yeah, thank you. And those tax policy is interesting to me. I'm a former actual tax accountant. And so uh, it always interesting for me to think about how tax policy uh, moves the housing market, frankly, it's, right? It's and amazing. It's, you know, I yeah. spent 30 years in fair housing. Now I'm learning <laughs> quite a lot about tax and, and it's sort of a reverse of you and, yeah. and, and finding that very exciting too. Yeah, yeah, it is interesting. And, I, and I'm not sure there's there's any any one answer to it. So anyone else want to weigh in on um, kind of kind of the real estate aspects of of how we incent getting and creating more opportunity, especially for first time home buyers, and knowing that those are the, the communities that we tend to serve quite often in our fair housing movement. Hi, Alan. I just wanted to point out this is Lisa from Napa. I just wanted to point uh, out to everyone that 
on, I think this Friday, the National Fair Housing Alliance, the National Association of Realtors, and the uh, National Community Stabilization Trust will be issuing a report in large part that addresses this issue. So the report is focusing on what can we do in the midst of the, uh, this COVID crisis to preserve home ownership, to preserve housing for uh, owner occupants. And um, we have a number of recommendations in that report. And so what we can do is, um, Alan, we can send the report out to everybody who registered for this event to share all of those recommendations. Yeah, do we have a splitter on our box? A splitter on our... I don't know, Mom. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. All right. Great. So let's uh, let me move on to another specific kind of question related to elements of the pandemic and specifically COVID-19. And, and um, uh, Nicole, this maybe you want to start on this. And this is about um, identification checks for different communities. So we recognize that in some immigrant or uh, for Asian American communities, um, we might adopt another name uh, in addition to our birth name and why, what might be shown on um, our IDs as we transition into um, life in the United States. Uh, what might that mean for, for that ID check in this world where especially, and we've seen a lot, housing providers as you're going to even see properties, right? See a rental property or asking for ID. Uh, and how might that play out for, um, for some of these communities? Sure, I'm, I'm actually in the process of reading what is the what. So learning about that process and how names can change um, was really interesting to me. But I think, as I mentioned before, in terms of checking ID in the self-guided tour situation, that is allowing um, someone who doesn't live on the property to access the property at night on their own time, you know, after after their work hours, so that they can tour the property. So I think it's it's on the one hand weighing the security risk of having someone on the property and not having anyone there, you know, monitoring, um, but also as the, the person in, who asked that question is making sure that there are clear exceptions and it's just been documented that there is a very good fair housing, just a very good reason why the ID doesn't match the person. Um, and, and that just needs to be documented to make sure that base is covered, but it shouldn't be a barrier to touring the property or, or applying. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's the same framework that you talked about um, in your example you gave, I think, about um, a trans transgender individual, right? So document right. why the um, ID might not match. Okay, great. Thanks. Anybody else that uh, wanted to weigh in? Janine, did you unmute to weigh in or just unmuted? No. Okay. I thought it was an excellent answer. <laughs> Appreciate that. Okay. Um, I think this is also along those same lines, and maybe Nicole, you can weigh in on this again, but is, are housing providers obligated to show or provide housing to folks who, um, who have or may have had COVID-19? And I think this also maybe Janine goes back to the question about disability. This is actually out here in Oregon, that's where we at the beginning of the pandemic started to see those kinds of intersections, right? And it was actually in rental contexts where a housing provider said, you know, we, we can't have you back into a unit because we believe you're in a profession where you have um, had a higher exposure to COVID-19. Uh, I think from our earlier discussions, it seems like that is uh, potential violations under the, the act um, with its relationship to disability. Um, is that how you are interpreting that, Nicole, with your uh, industry? And, and Janine, is that, does that follow from our discussion earlier? Yeah, I would certainly you know, defer to Janine on this, but I think for many of the reasons she already said, um, an owner shouldn't be asking those sorts of questions um, that would lead down that road. So I, I would be you know, concerned for them if, if they were taking that approach. So yeah. I, oh, I just thought I would follow on and um, say that it, it puts you in a potential area of significant risk. Uh, one, because of disability, but two, because you actually have no clue who has COVID-19. 
uh, some people have COVID-19 and are totally asymptomatic and don't even know it themselves. So uh, the most effective thing to do instead of trying to decide who has COVID-19 and who doesn't have COVID-19, which are not going to be at all effective in doing, is really just ensure that the appropriate precautions are taken in accordance with the CDC recommendations. You know, I'd also um, I'd also indicate that there, you know, if you're going to impose any kind of a rule, you actually have to impose it exactly equally for everyone, except you have to make reasonable accommodations for individuals with disabilities. And if the rule uh, has a disproportionate impact on certain groups of people, you again cause yourself potential fair housing problems. And I, I was going to say the same thing, that with asymptomatic transmission, really, you know, follow a policy where you're taking precautions with respect to everybody. Um, you know, when early in the pandemic, we put out guidance at the National Association of Realtors regarding showings uh, mm -hmm. during this time. Um, and, you know, that was our guidance and certainly don't make you know, assumptions about any community or any professions of people, you know, have a consistent policy. Um, now, if someone calls you up and we had to deal with this too and says, hey, you know, I have COVID-19, I'd like to come down to the open house, um, you do not have an obligation to expose yourself to a potentially fatal uh, condition, um, but you can uh, and should uh, work with that person to provide a reasonable accommodation for how they can see the property um, without posing any risk to yourself and others. So um, that guidance also is there on our website at nar.realtor. So um, the other thing that I would mention is uh, you referenced the possibility of um, someone trying to limit people from certain professions. And again, that's a problematic area. Uh, for example, if someone were to say, I'm unwilling to rent to healthcare workers, you are then likely dealing with people who associate with people with disabilities. So you have some associational discrimination problems there. And there are also certain, pro certain professions that are um, represented uh, disproportionately by people from certain races, national origins, et cetera. So you again have the possibility that people who come into contact with the public more and who may be viewed as more likely to have an infectious disease, um, applying those types of rules could have um, discriminatory effects. And Alan, I just put a, a link to a resource that might be helpful to folks in the chat box. It is a, a document, it's a legal document um, that um, um, sort of a legal analysis that the National Fair Housing Alliance completed uh, right when the COVID pandemic was declared. And then we updated it in the fall of last year. And so people might find that as a useful resource so I, I just put the link to it in the chat box and hopefully everybody can see it. Great, thank you. Yeah, we, were, we access that as an organization and have, have built kind of our framework around that same. So it's very, very, very helpful to have that guidance from, from NAFA for our, for our members. And I would think for folks in the industry um, broader also. We've got just a couple more minutes here and I just wanna um, to, to switch back over and talk about where we started uh, kind of originally sec Assistant Secretary Warden about um, the sexual harassment complaints. We had somebody that asked about uh, having ongoing issues with clients that have been filing complaints with HUD but not being contacted back by an investigator for some time, uh, which can be troubling for, for um, especially sexual harassment complaints that can be quite timely and, and have folks under some very difficult situations. Any suggestions from you or Sheena about um, how best to handle this, uh, and especially if it's not a, a pattern or practice uh, piece for the DOJ. And I know Sheena said that definitely, uh, you know, getting in contact with them is important also. But any suggestions on how to best move those forward? So if, if someone has filed a complaint with HUD and for some reason they are not hearing back, uh, it's always good to check in with someone on the HUD management team. 
believe it or not, I personally receive a lot of emails from people who have concerns about their complaint not being processed correctly. While I would prefer that not every email come to me personally, I do think there are always managers in the HUD hierarchy who are very happy to check and see what's happening with an individual's complaint. And if it's really not moving along the way it should be, we can make sure that it gets attention. So um, uh, you can typically look at the a HUD website and locate someone in the FATO management chain for the area of the country that it's involved in. And if you don't get a response from that person, then you definitely do want to come up the chain and reach out to me. And my email address is, is readily out there. It's right on the HUD website. Thank you so much. And Sheena, anything from you about uh, folks that might be working with DOJ? Um, well, as I had mentioned earlier, uh, we, we do have a, a dedicated person who's dedicated to um, screen all the calls and to um, read all the emails and to follow up uh, with complainants um, to interview them on occasion to determine um, whether uh, they're, um, whether the conduct would fall within our jurisdiction, whether there might be other individuals. So far, we've been able to, you know, obviously give people a call back. Uh, but I think the first stop for most people should be HUD or fair housing groups to help individuals uh, you know, get their complaints in shape for HUD. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. I've, of course, as the leader of a, uh, a qualified fair housing organization, I would concur with that. We definitely wanna hear from everybody out there who is experiencing any type of discrimination, or harassment in their housing situation um, so that we can help you um, protect your rights in housing. Folks, we are getting near the top of the hour. And so I wanna just make sure we wrap this up and get folks back on with their day. And I cannot thank our panelists enough for what they have brought us here this afternoon. Um, Assistant Secretary Warden, um, Brian, Sheena, Nicole, Lisa, uh, this has been a enlightening and engaging look at what we have all been through over the past year plus. Um, and I know that by thinking about how we continue to move these issues forward from that fair housing perspective, that we can help move our communities to a place of resiliency and be ready for the next crisis that comes our way. I wanna thank everybody that joined us here this afternoon. Um, I do wanna note that uh, uh, NAFA and HUD are also co-sponsoring another Facebook Live event on April 29th that will discuss similar issues as this related to housing discrimination during COVID-19. It'll be at 2 p.m. on April 29th. And so go to NAFA's Facebook page at Facebook slash National Fair Housing Alliance to connect with that event. Um, also, a, another quick note for folks who may have been monitoring the news while we have been on our webinar, um, the uh, there is a, a jury verdict on the Derek Chauvin trial that is, was to be announced um, between 4.30 and 5 Eastern time. So that may be uh, coming up shortly. Uh, and so we know that those kinds of issues are vitally important to our community. So please, everyone, take care of yourself. Thank you so much for attending today. And we will look forward to hearing from you and seeing you at events in the future. Thank you all so much. <laughs>